Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Today's gonna to be a fun video, I think. Um, we're gonna talk about my favorite five receivers and my favorite five speakers from the 1970s. So sit back, get comfortable, and let's talk about that list. So I'd like to go ahead and start out the list with a company that many of you know I have quite an affinity for, and that would be Harman Kardon. Um, as many of you know, I had a long relationship with the company. Uh, and so there's a special place in my heart for it. But <clears throat> it started back in the 70s. So during the 1970s, the Watt Wars were going on. All the big, what I call the PMS uh, companies, Pioneer, Marantz, and Sansui, were all competing for Watts. And everybody figured chasing Watts because they could market Watts and then they could market THD as if they were important specifications. I think everyone understands that speakers don't run on watts, speakers run on current, alternating current, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, and you measure current in amps, not watts. So, you know, that was the thing was, with Harman Kardon was high current capability, ultra wide bandwidth, so instead of just worrying about 20 to 20,000, they would go from 10 to 500,000 oftentimes, because if there was a, a, an anomaly up at 100,000 Hertz, and that there's a harmonic comes back at 50, comes back at 25, comes back at 12 and a half, comes back at you know 6250, that's in the audible range now, and that can add distortion and obviously cloud the sound of the music and mask fine details. So ultra wide bandwidth was a big deal. So rather than coming out with a high wattage, and Harman didn't ever play the Watt Wars, rather than coming out with a high power receiver, they came out with a unique design called the twin power receivers. Now, if you open up and you'll see here the picture of the twin power receiver internally, it's two mono amps in a receiver. There were standalone stereo amps in those days that weren't a dual mono design, let alone finding it in a receiver. So the one I'm most familiar with is the Twin Power 730, which was rated at 40 watts a channel, but high current capability, ultra wide bandwidth. You could take that and put it up against one of these big monster receivers from the PMS guys, and you could absolutely play louder, cleaner, and crisper off that 40 watt Harman than you could off that 100 watt other brand receiver. And then the other thing about Harman uh, was the build quality was just absolutely second to none. Um, quite remarkable, the build quality. And again, who dual mono in a receiver? That's really unique. There's, no one does that even nowadays. And it's hard to find standalone power amplifiers that are even today that are like that. A few on the obviously very premium. The other nice thing about the Twin Power was very well built, super reliable, um, fixable. Still to this day, they're priced by collectors. And it just, it was a sonic you know, a notch above everything else from that PMS category of products out there. And I think that was a standout feature. Again, the build quality, the sound quality was absolutely outstanding in, in that day and age. Now, also in that day and age, a really popular receiver, and I think it might've been Harman's most popular selling name plate was the HK330. Now the 330 came around in various um, iterations. The one I'm most familiar with, and many people are, is the 330C. Now the 330C was the entry level receiver from Harman Kardon. It was only rated at 20 watts a channel, but it had a ton of current capability. And again, ultra wide bandwidth. Harman typically measured their amplifiers from 10 Hertz to 500,000 Hertz. And the 330C was no exception. And I remember when we were selling the, late, the later versions of the 330, we'd take it and put it up against a hundred watt a channel, whatever other brand you wanted. And, the, and ask the, co the consumer to turn it up and adjust it to where they wanted, where they felt it was comfortable, and then sit back and listen to it and then do the same with that other receiver. And almost all the time, people, their minds were blown that only 20 watts a channel could sound crisper and louder and more dynamic than 100 watts a channel. And again, ultra wide bandwidth, uh, high current capability, um, those kinds of things, and just robust build quality, quality components and everything else. That was kind of the hallmark of the Harman Kardon brand in the 70s through the 80s. It started to change later uh, after Dr. Harman retired and things like that. But in this day and age, remember Harman invented the receiver. So they have, you know, back in 1953, 
uh, Sidney Herman and Bernie Cardin started Harman Cardin, and they invented the receiver. And it was a monophonic thing, but it was the first time someone had put a, a tuner, a preamp, and an amp in one box. And then they had the very first stereo receiver, which in those days was one channel was on FM and one channel was on AM. And then eventually they figured out how to multiplex FM to get two channels of stereo on each. And of course, Harman was right there with a stereo receiver. So they have a long history of the receivers and take, took a lot of pride in that product category and put for a, an absolutely stellar effort in building those. So that's the Harman Kardon receivers, those three actually, the Twin Power 740-730, I know the 730, and the 330C. Well, you can't do a 1970s receiver roundup without including Marantz. And the Marantz 2235 is the one I have the most experience with. What a wonderful piece this was, 35 watts a channel, just an amazing build quality. The nice thing about Marantz in these days, they paid attention to how it looked and how it felt and you know all metal knobs and they felt like they were machined out of a you know a piece of solid uh, metal the face plates were gorgeous the displays were of course a beautiful blue tuning dial and you know the meters and everything and the the thumb wheel gyroscopic tuning just wonderful great build quality and sound quality wise while Harman was very neutral very accurate and um Marantz would have been kind of more on the side of warmth. Um, they were very listenable, very pleasant. Um, they didn't image quite like the Harmons did, but it was still very nice. And again, imaging wasn't as big a deal for us back in those days. We didn't understand it because a lot of the speakers we had weren't really that great at imaging because it was a big box with a big woofer and a cone tweeter in it. Um, so those kinds of things were, were, they were just starting to emerge in the later 70s and in the 80s and as high-end separate components and those kinds of companies came along in the late 70s and 80s then high-end audio audio file kind of thing started happening more and more and became a little bit more mainstream but in the day the Marantz oh my goodness the whole lineup from Marantz in that period was just wonderful and of course as you know they're worth their weight in gold right now so the Marantz 2235 absolutely makes the list as an absolute favorite an absolute beauty just a wonderful piece of gear well, the next receiver I want to talk about is not what you would expect, I don't think. It's from NAD, New Acoustics, New Acoustic Dimensions. NAD didn't have the heritage of Marantz and Fisher and Macintosh and Harman Kardon. They'd started out kind of in the late 60s, early 70s. And their thing was really going after sound quality and not the Watt Wars and not fancy displays, just basic clean designs, very cool industrial designs, but just a really good circuit layout, very good design uh, and good quality components. So the one I want to talk about is the 30, excuse me, the 7020 receiver. It was an excellent piece. It was rated at 20 watts a channel. And like a lot of folks in these days, a Harman especially, NAD especially, I think they underrated or were conservative in their ratings. The 7020 had really good power to it. it had a lot of dynamic range and it was kind of different than what the what i call pms brands you know pioneer Marantz and sansui offered in the day they were chasing watts and chasing thd where folks like nad and Harmon Kardon were chasing sound quality first and foremost and weren't really worried as much about how many watts it had or whatever so the nad was had a great warm sound very detailed very good imaging, especially in its day when, again, imaging was still not really a big thing for us as listeners. We wanted good full sound and a lot of power and a lot of bass, really. And the NAD did a really good job of that because it was a high current design um, and it just good quality components. It was a very simple and very uh, elegant kind of industrial design. Not a lot of fancy features, not a lot of glitz and glamour. Um, but it could drive any speaker you wanted to, and it drove them very well. And the 7020 kind of was the forerunner of during the 80s when NAD really kind of hit their stride with little small integrated amps like the 3020 and the 3020i, which are legendary for their sound quality. And obviously, then you get into those receivers from that period, the 70, 7240 and things like that. That's This is the 7020 is the piece that started that movement and started earning NAD, that reputation for super high quality sound, good build quality, and just really great performance overall. So the NAD 7020 makes my list. Now this one might be a bit unexpected and there's a little history behind this. So in 1975, uh, one of the first jobs I had was I worked at Radio Shack. So guess what makes the list? <laughs> the Realistic STA 2080. Now this was a powerhouse in its day. 
And probably one of the more powerful receivers I had a lot of experience with, it was rated at 80 watts a channel into eight ohms. Now, you have to remember in the day, Radio Shack was by far, by far the largest seller of consumer hi-fi, home hi-fi products in the US, possibly the world. And their own brands were actually, some of them were built by uh, manufacturers or factories in, in Japan that actually built big brand name products. And I won't mention any because it really doesn't matter, but they came out of the same factory as a lot of the more popular brands. So the nice thing about the STA 2080 was back in the day, we're in the store, in the mall, right? And you had the, the STA 2080 and you had the big Radio Shack Mach 5 speakers, which were horrible sounding things with big giant woofers and horn mid ranges and horn tweeters and just boom sizzle is what we called it. Um, but that's what sold. You know, people walk in and go, oh my man, what's the loudest speaker you got? Or how many watts are those speakers? Like speakers have any watts. Um, but anyway, I mean, that was just the way it was in those days. And that's fine because we didn't understand really, we weren't thinking about imaging and we weren't necessarily thinking about clarity and full range and detail. We wanted to be pounded in the chest by, you know, the latest Foreigner album or, you know, that Black Sabbath album or whatever it was. So we wanted that, you know, almost kind of live music volume level and experience at home. So the STA 2080 from Radio Shack did a great job. It was extraordinarily well built, very powerful, very dynamic. Um, it had a great phono preamp and it had lots of goes into and goes out as I don't think I have a picture of the back. If I do, it will appear there, but I don't think I do. Um, it had, like I said, just a lot of features. It was very full features. It was right up at the top of the line for the realistic products. Um, and it was really, really good. So the realistic 2080 makes my list of top five receivers for the 70s. Next, we're going to talk about my top five speakers from the 70s. Well, now let's talk about my top five speakers from the 1970s. And I'm going to start out a brand that many people aren't really familiar with. They don't have a lot of distribution, it seems, these days in the United States. But back in the 70s, and the late 70s and 80s, they were starting to make some inroads here in the U.S. And it's a company called Morden Short. Now, Morden Short's a British company, um, and they are part of that group of British speaker companies that were starting to emerge in the 70s and make making some names for themselves here in the US like Kef, B&W, Morden Short, Mission, Wharfdale, and of course the granddaddy of them all, Tannoy. Um, and it's a curious fact, if you, I don't know if you're aware of it, in Great Britain, a public address system isn't called a public address system, it's called a tannoy, because all the big horns in the public address systems said tannoy on the side. It's very much like they call vacuuming hoovering. So anyway, interesting note. But Morden Short was really interesting, and it's the Pageant 2 series I want to talk about. They were really well constructed, real wood cabinets. They were smaller than what we were used to. It was a six and a half inch woofer, but the key thing was it was a dome tweeter, not a cone tweeter. A lot of speakers in that period were still using cone speakers. They looked like just little miniature woofers or little smaller mid-ranges, but the dome tweeter had this characteristic of being able to be really resolving and started to, it, it started to get us interested in this whole concept of imaging because we had people at, you know, like Jay Gordon Holt, the editor of Stereophile Magazine, talking about imaging and instrument placement and space and things like that. So the Morton Short Pageant Series 2 was excellent at that. It was, had really good frequency response. It was only a six inch woofer, so it was 50 hertz to 20,000, but it was detailed and smooth and had a really nice mid range. Um, it was, uh, excellent sounding, you know, like I said, real clear, real smooth. And all of a sudden we were starting to hear, all right, well, that instrument's over there and this instrument's over there. And the singer, you know, we're used to hear, kind of hearing the singer in the center of the mix, but now we can hear the, the backup singers over on this side. So that was the thing that started to introduce us to imaging quality. And of course, we would pair those up really well with the Harman Kardon product or the NAD product because that would really give you an excellent image. Better, I hate to say it, better than the PMS brands, but it was just wonderful. So the Morton Short Pageant Series 2 is one of my top five speakers from the 70s. Well, the next speaker on my list is probably the most influential or certainly one of the most legendary uh, speakers from the early 70s. And that would be the Henry Kloss designed large advent speaker. It was so popular. This was a, an amazing product. This was, might be 
the earliest, it, it, certainly to my memory, it's the earliest use of a dome tweeter. And it was the probably the very first tweeter to use ferrofluid for cooling the voice call. Ferrofluid is like um, liquid, uh, what do they call that? Uh, they use it in air conditioning, Freon, and it has small, super small iron uh, filings in it to dissipate heat, to pull heat away from the voice call of the tweeter because tweeters don't handle a lot of power. But anyway, so dome tweeter, 10 inch woofer, so it had bass. Now, it was an acoustic suspension or sealed box speaker, so it didn't have a ton of deep bass, but what it did have was good, fast attack. Sealed box speakers have a tendency to do, deliver a really good bass response and a very smooth roll off without overloading. You get a ported speaker if it's not super well designed. As the music information gets close to the tuning port of the frequency, the woofer unloads and it acts like it's playing in no enclosure whatsoever. It's called playing in free air. So as the woofer gets close to the tuning frequency, it starts to unload. Well, in a sealed box, you have that air inside the box to act as a spring. Because obviously a woofer, you know, all speakers work by compressing or rarefying the air right next to the cone to create sound waves. So the ability to have that that good tight spring behind the woofer kept it controlled and very well damped and gave you a good extended response but it rolled off smoothly and very, very gently. So it was, they were rated down to 30 hertz, 30 to 20 hertz. That might be an in-room response and a little bit generous. Um, I don't, they were great sounding. I, I, all I know is they great bass, um, very smooth, very well detailed, um, and, it, and super prized these days by collectors. Um, I really liked the large advents. I had friends that had some. Um, and had a lot of experience with them because we used to take them and trade at the store and things like that. Really well constructed, good braced cabinet, um, but really well designed in a sea of big boxes with floppy woofers in them. I mean, that's really kind of the market in the 70s was these big, you know, 15 inch woofers with horn tweeters and horn mid ranges and a super tweeter in a big ported box that didn't really work. And the box sounded like a hollow cabinet. The advent, the large advent was really the defining speaker of its day for sure. So the large advent speaker absolutely makes the list of top five speakers for me. Well, next on my list is a speaker that defined really that transition from the 70s into the 80s where we started thinking about high end audio and we started thinking about imaging and frequency response and sound stage and all that kind of stuff. And it is the legendary Vandersteen, Vandersteen Model 2. This was a revelation of a speaker. Uh, it looks very familiar. They still offer that model in its latest generation, um, but it was just a revelation to those of us that were really enthusiastic about audio. It is was amazing. It used a, a one-inch alloy dome tweeter. So this was one of the one of the earliest implementations of a metal dome tweeter that I can think of, um, and it was really detailed and very extended. It used a five and a half inch, excuse me, a four and a half inch mid-range driver um, in its own separate cabinet, and then it had an eight inch woofer in the base cabinet portion of it with a 10 inch radiator on the back. So really good extended uh, frequency response. They claim 29 to 29,000 Hertz. Um, I will give them into the low thirties pretty honestly and still to this day. This speaker was amazing. The cabinets were extraordinarily well designed. The, just the overall aesthetic of the speaker was just amazing to us. We had no, none of us had really heard anything quite like that. And again, this is in the late seventies when these kind of audiophile targeted high end products were starting to become available um, because there was enough demand in the marketplace. All right, I've had my big Pioneer HPM 100s. What's next? You know, I've had my Technique speakers. What's next? I want something more detailed than XYZ speaker or whatever, my big JBLs or whatever. And so there was a demand in the market for these kind of advanced designs and the Vandersteen Model 2 was absolutely at the vanguard of that in this period of time. And they still to this day are revered for their um, absolute sound quality. And the model, as I said, is still currently available and it is still an outstanding speaker. So the Vandersteen, the original Model 2s, definitely a high watermark in the 70s for speaker design and speaker performance. Well, the next speaker on the list is one that started the, the reputation of the building the reputation for this still extraordinarily famous speaker product line. 
And we were one of the largest dealers for these speakers uh, here in, in Chicago, certainly maybe nationally, you know, from the 80s into the early 90s. And that is the Kef Kalinda. Now, the Kalinda is, was a slim design, really beautiful aesthetics, very elegant. Um, it had real wood veneers on it, and it was just an interesting design. And it contained, and for those big Kef fans out there, they're going to recognize this. This was the T27 one-inch Mylar Dome tweeter, very famous. And that's actually the same tweeter that's used in the legendary BBC LS35A speaker. It used a four and a half inch B110 mid-range. Again, that's the mid-range or the base driver in the famous LSA, LS35A BBC monitor. And then it used the really unusual oblong B200 base driver. And the B200 base driver found itself into a bunch of other brands of speakers, British brands of speakers. The one that comes to mind first is, and if I can find a picture, I'll pop it up here, was the Lynn Isobaric. And the reason they used oblong drivers was the way they mounted them they mounted them from behind and you couldn't get a round woofer through the hole that would fit the flange. So the oblong driver, you could take it in and put it in the hole and bring it up and mount it from behind. Just an interesting fun fact. But anyway, it was a famous speaker that was absolutely excellent. And again, this is that epitome and probably what hooked me into having a, a strong liking for that classic British sound. Unfortunately, Brands like Kef and B&W have kind of lost their way these days, and they're going after some quote-unquote audiophile detailed sound, which just to me is bright and strident and fatiguing over time. And I'm not sure there's actually any more detail there than there was on these kinds of speakers. Um, they sounded amazing, and they threw a gorgeous image. And they were just full range and natural sounding and just kind of really beautiful. It was very musical. And that may be the best way to describe the Kef Kalinda. It was a musical speaker. So that's the Kef Kalinda. All right, for the last speaker on the list, we're going way down the obscure rabbit hole and it's the Utah HS1. Now Utah speakers were renowned for their innovation in audio technology. Utah also made raw drivers for a lot of other speaker companies. Um, they were actually founded in the early 1920s as the Utah Radio Products Company. And again, OEM manufacturing products for radio speakers primarily. Um, they had a factory in Indiana and they were, um, you know, became part of a, a really well-known corporation called the Chicago Telephone Supply Company. And again, they had that factory in Indiana, but they used to manufacture speakers under their own brand, under the Utah Heritage uh, nom de plume. And they were really well built. And this is kind of a late 60s into early 70s carryover speaker, not strictly just 70s. But the HS1 was unique. It had a big 12 inch woofer. It had a four inch mid range tw tweeter. And it was one of very common in the day, originally had a horn loaded tweeter and then eventually moved to a cone or dome tweeter. Um, but it was really an interesting design. And this was one of the first speakers I had heard really in the late 60s that carried into the 70s as far as availability of, of you know, you could purchase it. But Utah had a legendary reputation. Um, and again, for supplying speakers to other manufacturers. So the HS1 was a three-way, 12-inch uh, woofer, four-inch mid-range, either a horn-loaded or cone tweeter. Uh, it had a frequency response of 30 to 20,000. It handled, it had very high power handling, which was really one of the big deals for it because that became, that was starting to become an advertising spec is high power handling. Um, it was a very balanced sound. It could be a little hot on the top end with that horn, but the, the, the regular tweeter one sounded much, much better. But it was really good to... You know, for those folks that before the JBL L100 came out, you wanted that big speaker sound, that kind of more loud sound. You didn't necessarily, you know, these had more bass than a comparable clip speaker, you know, the heresy in the day. Um, so this was a very popular speaker for those people who wanted that exciting sound and they wanted that, you know, good bass response and the ability to play loud um, and, and for loud for long periods of time. So that's that esoteric, weird, only Ed would remember this speaker, the Utah HS1. So that wraps up my top five uh, receivers from the 70s and my top five speakers for the 70s. And hopefully you enjoyed that video. And if you did, I would greatly appreciate a like and a subscribe. And if you want to buy me a granola bar, there's a thank you button in the bottom of the video window here. And also, if you'd like to support the channel, there is a membership link in the pinned comment and the description of the video. 
And in the video description are affiliate links and everybody knows what the drill on the affiliate links are. And again, down a little further are some playlists and there are playlists of tracks that I use when I'm evaluating equipment, just so you can kind of, excuse me, so you can kind of get an insight into what I'm listening to and maybe how I'm evaluating things to see if there's a better, see if you can connect to that a little better. Also too, I would appreciate, you know, a lot of folks have been sending me playlists. That's great. I, I would like to continue that. That list is getting nice and long. Um, and I would love to get some more playlists from you guys. And comment. Anybody who comments knows I respond to the comments. I answer them. Uh, if you ask a question, I try to give you an answer. And if I don't have the answer, I try to point you in the right direction. So I would appreciate your like, your subscription, your comment. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm on Instagram at, at old guy hi fi. I think that's everything I need to say about the top five receivers and top five speakers from the 1970s. Thank you guys so very much. We passed through 5,000 subscribers and I, my subscribers and my channel members, I just owe you guys a debt of gratitude. I won't be able to repay. It's so humbling and it's so wonderful. And thank you guys so very much. This is Ed Holmud, Old Guy Hi-Fi channel saying, now it's time for you to go listen to some music. Maybe drag out some vintage hi-fi gear and listen to it on that. Thanks so much and have a great day. Oh.